We're going to have a reading from the Old Testament, book of First Chronicles, uh, chapter 12. In my Bible, it's page 417, but uh, that may well be different for you. Uh, First Chronicles is located just after Kings, because it deals with events pertaining to the kings of Israel. And in this morning's reading, we read about that moment when David had been anointed, but not yet crowned ruler over the nation. Would people keep on supporting Saul? Or would they read the situation right and give allegiance to God's anointed servant, David? And so we'll read from verse 22. First Chronicles 12, 22. This is God's word. Day after day, men came to help David until he had a great army like the army of God. These are the numbers of the men armed for battle who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him, as the Lord had said. Men of Judah, carrying shield and spear, 6,800 armed for battle. Men of Simeon, warriors ready for battle. Men of Levi, including Jehoiada, leader of the family of Aaron, with 3,700 men, and Zadok, a brave young warrior with 22 officers from his family, men of Benjamin, Saul's kinsmen, most of whom had remained loyal to Saul's house until then, men of Ephraim, brave warriors, famous in their own clans, men of half the tribe of Manasseh, designated by name to come and make David king, verse 33, men of Zebulun, experienced soldiers prepared for battle with every type of weapon to help David with undivided loyalty. Men of Naphtali, 1,000 officers together with 37,000 men carrying shields and spears. Men of Dan ready for battle. Men of Asher, experienced soldiers prepared for battle, 40,000. And from east of the Jordan, men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, armed with every type of weapon. And then verse 32, men of Ishakar, who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Two hundred chiefs with all their relatives under their command. Verse 38, All these were fighting men who volunteered to serve in the ranks. They came to Hebron fully determined to make David king over all Israel. All the rest of the Israelites were also of one mind to make David king. This summer, we have been thinking about wisdom. Wisdom from Proverbs is never theoretical. It is always practical. The Bible gives us practical wisdom pertaining to how we live and in whom we trust. When we trust in Jesus and build our life upon him, then we are granted practical wisdom concerning relationships, money, work, everyday decisions. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And that is something that many of you know from personal experience. Today at the start of this new term, the beginning of September, it is good to reflect on our time of prayer and to consider in these unusual days, in these peculiar circumstances, how we as a congregation may best do church. And for this, I would like us uh, to look at a verse in the uh, obscure book from the Old Testament, which we've been reading from, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32 which talks about the men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. I wonder if you can remember back to our series on Joseph 
as of Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. Joseph was one of the twelve sons of Israel, and one of Joseph's brothers was called Ishakar. Well, these are the descendants of that son, the men of Ishakar. The ninth of the twelve tribes of Israel had insight which was critical for the people of God at this specific moment in time and was able to lead them to understanding. At this time, Saul was king of Israel, but David had been designated a successor, although not yet crowned. It was a time of relational breakdown and civic conflict. Large numbers of fighting troops had already defected to David, and the men of Issachar cast their lot with David rather than Saul at this pivotal moment in history for the people of God. There are two things for us to note. The first is, here were leaders who understood the time. In other words, here were people who were keen observers of change and who were prepared to ask the question why things were the way they were and how they could lead effective lives at that specific moment in time. Here were leaders not content merely to drift and go with the tide and see where it might take them, but who thought about the context in which they found themselves and were prepared to let that analysis shape their situation. And by the way, note, here were men, plural, of Ishakar, who understood the times. Not one man. Here was the power of collective thinking and united leadership. How fortunate we are here in Bloomfield that we're not a group of isolated individuals who have to plough an individual path. We have a body of leaders who together have the welfare of our congregation close to their hearts. Leaders and elders who together collectively are prepared to think about our present circumstances, analyze its implications, not merely hoping that somehow things will immediately pass away or this crisis will just disappear. People who together are prepared to consider the hard questions of how we might do church and seek God's direction at this place in this time. But not only were the men of Ishakar prepared to analyze people who understood the times, but they were also prepared to strategize and to discern what Israel ought to do. Those within whom God's Holy Spirit resides, those who seek the wisdom of Jesus, who is our rock, who is our wisdom upon whom we build, need to move beyond mere observation to the interpretation and application of wisdom. Won't you therefore pray for our leaders, for our elders, that together at the start of this new term, collectively, with one voice, in one attitude, with one desire, we may seek to discern where God is leading at this specific moment in time. Recognizing that this new temporary does not look the way things were one year ago when we started off last September. Rather, this is a moment during which we are called to know Jesus and share his love. We're not to live in regret nor are we to put things on hold until some hypothetical moment in the future which may bring us back to the way we once were, but together to move in faith with eager expectation and anticipation. 
I wonder how, if you noticed in our reading from First Chronicles how it concluded this morning. Having highlighted those fighting men from the 12 tribes of Israel, 1 Chronicles 12 verse 38 tells us that all of those who volunteered to serve in the ranks came to Hebron fully desiring and determining to make David king over Israel. And that's what at this moment, in these particular times, united the people of God. Together they determined to make God's anointed king over Israel. Listen, we live in what has to be one of the oddest times in living memory. Certainly the strangest in my ministry. A peculiar moment when because of a deadly virus we are forced to do things differently. But can I suggest that if together, as a congregation, we are fully determined to make King David's greater son, the Lord Jesus, king over our lives, acknowledge him as head of the church, acknowledge him as the king of this broken, fragile world of which we are a part, then we cannot go wrong. Whatever our circumstances, whatever our situation, it is always the right thing to do to acknowledge God's anointed as the king. And so we pray. And in the quietness we come before Almighty God, as we are, with all our doubts and fears, all our worries and concerns, all our questions and anxieties. These are challenging days, dear Lord, but they do not come as a surprise to you. These are disconcerting times when we must decide what we trust in and in whom we place our hope. In the old ways of the past or the new way of the future. And together, Heavenly Father, like the men of Ishakar, collectively, we would seek to understand the times And with your wisdom, know what we should do in our life and witness in this place, in our day-to-day decisions, at home, in school, at college, within our work contexts, in our plans and hopes and dreams for the future. We seek your wisdom and guidance. Heavenly Father, enable us to trust in the Lord with all our hearts, to lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways to acknowledge him, knowing that he will make our path straight. And what we pray for ourselves as a congregation, we pray for others who are on our minds for students heading off to college for the very first time, for the Bester family as very imminently they move to Australia, for Robert and Alison, Guy and Kuhn as they travel, experience quarantine, set up home in a new place, for Abigail as she remains here at university, for Granny and Grandpa, Rini and Richard. Heavenly Father, please will you continue to bless the Bester family. May they quickly find a congregation where they feel at home and continue to make them a blessing to all that they meet. We pray for other parts of the world which weigh heavily on our hearts. 
the people of Beirut one month after that dreadful explosion. For the tense situation in Portland in the United States. For the raging fires of the Amazon. For the political upheaval in Belarus. And for the volume of violence in Nigeria. Father God, wisdom is needed in all these contexts and each of these situations. We pray that you will come near and enable us and the world to place our hope and trust not in ourselves, but in the anointed King. In whose name we pray. Amen.